the God of forces. That's a capital G, too. The God of forces. Hmm. Interesting. Brother, um, I'll get to that um, as soon as possible. Uh, might not, probably won't be today. Hopefully tomorrow I'll get back to you on that. Okay? So, so you know. All right. But the God of forces. Hmm. And also, brother. Now, another brother I'm addressing here. Um, <laughs> I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised at all. Because if, if I'm not mistaken... Didn't you yourself, brother, a couple of, uh, like a year or two ago uh, with that one video where you quoted uh, Lamentations chapter 4, uh, verses uh, 18 and 19? They hunt our steps that we cannot go in our streets. Our end is near. Our days are fulfilled for our end has come. Our persecutors are swifter than the eagles of the heaven. They pursued us upon the mountains. They laid wait for us in the wilderness. Ah, I'm, I'm not surprised whatsoever about uh, <laughs> about uh, what you uh, mentioned to me. Why is that? Why is that? Some of you are like, what are you talking about? I'm talking about people who honor the God of forces. What on earth are you talking about? Please get your authorized version of the scriptures. And please follow me along word for word, verse by verse at the scriptures that you and I will be looking at today. Follow me along. Make sure I'm telling you the truth. Make sure I'm not lying to you. Read along with me because sometimes this, you know, the mouth gets going a little quicker than the brain. And sometimes I will skip a groove, unfortunately. Okay? So pay attention. Okay? Be a Berean. Okay, follow me along. Don't, 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 don't just sit there. Get the scriptures. Come on, the authorized version. Don't, don't get a Bible. Get the scriptures and come on, follow me along. Okay, word for word, verse by verse. Let's remind ourselves, though, of some things because today we are primarily going to be within the Old Testament. Okay, but let us remind ourselves of a few things. Okay, first and foremost. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. You, you need to have that in, ingrained in your head. Okay? Romans chapter 15, verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Okay? And of course... 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. What things were written for time were written for our learning, making reference unto the Old Testament and things that are under the law as written thereunto within that dispensation. Okay? Like I tell you, you want to learn how to fear the Lord for today? Read the Old Testament. Okay? All right? But go to Obadiah. Obadiah. Go to Obadiah. Now, we're going to be looking at primarily, we're going to be primarily in the Old Testament today, okay? And we're going to right away start out with some things that you will notice right away are dressing different bodies of people. But the overall thing that is being addressed within these different bodies of people are what? We'll let you figure that out as we go. Obadiah! Obadiah. Obadiah is right after Amos. Okay? Obadiah. Verses 1 on to verse 9. The vision of Obadiah. 
Thus said the Lord God concerning Edom, the brother of Jacob, Edom. Okay? These willfully ignorant, stupid, stupid is willful ignorance. These stupid black Hebrew Israelites like to call people Edom. Okay? That they are Jacob and that uh, those who are not of their skin color are Edom, right? I'm telling you, some of the most vile kindredists out there, you know. But, as, we, as I have said to you before, there's nothing worse as far as a kindredist. There is nothing worse than a white supremacist. Nothing worse than that. Nothing worse than that. Okay? But, remember, Edom is the brother of Jacob. Okay? All right. Not as the black Hebrew Israelite will have you to believe, that, and they say in a satanic way try to twist that all into the color of skin, as if God is a, rep a respecter of persons today, which He is not. Okay. Uh, six minutes. Do I got your attention now? Huh? Good. All right. The vision of Obadiah. Thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. <laughs> the pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Bible Baptist Bookstore? Black Hebrew Israelites? Disgusting, vile, white supremacists? Hmm? Yeah. Catholics? Hmm? Oh yeah, I hope I got your attention now, don't I? Yeah, let's continue. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, so much better than other people. Because you you know, because you're one of the chosen, right? Or you worship the God of forces and have made a mortal man your big G God. Bible Baptist bookstore, the modern Ruckmanite. That saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. And those of you who know the scriptures right away, you're thinking of what? Isaiah 14, right? Yeah. What is, and for those of you who don't know, Isaiah 14, that's Lucifer, Satan, talking about how he will be like the Most High. Okay? Lucifer, Satan, the old serpent, he wants to be like God. Okay? Verse 5. If thieves come to thee, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? If the grape gatherers came to thee, would they not leave some grapes? How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? All the men of thy, of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. That they, they that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding in him. Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom, and understanding out of the mount of Esau? And thy mighty men, O Timon, shall be dismayed to the end that every one of the mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. Now, obviously, this is talking about Esau, right? right? Yes, yes, okay? Instruction and righteousness here. What? In talking of Esau, what is the Lord addressing there primarily in Esau? 
Yeah, you, come on, come on. Even, even a child could understand what the Lord is getting at here in the book of Obadiah. Okay, let's continue. Go to Isaiah chapter 16. Now, again, a different body of person, spirit, soul, and body, uh, is being addressed here. But as what our Lord was addressing in Obadiah, he is also addressing here in Isaiah onto another body of people. Okay? But the same thing is going to be addressed. Isaiah 16, one verse here, verse 6. We have heard of the pride of Moab. Moab, the Moabites. Moab, descended of Lot with, from his incestuous relations with his daughters. Because the daughters thought that all men were obliterated from off the earth because only Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed and whatnot. So they got their father drunk and yada, 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 yada. Okay? Moab. Okay? We have heard of the pride of Moab. He is very proud, even of his haughtiness and his pride and his wrath. But his lies shall not be so. Now, Isaiah, excuse me, Jeremiah 48. Have you noticed this one before yet, brother, sister? Jeremiah 48, 28 on to verse 31. O ye that dwell in Moab, leave the cities and dwell in the rock and be like the dove that maketh her nest in the sides of the hole's mouth. We have heard of the pride of Moab. He is exceeding proud. His loftiness I just lost my place. His loftiness, his arrogancy, and his pride and the haughtiness of his heart. Hmm. God of forces. Hmm. I know his wrath, saith the Lord, but it shall not be so. His lies shall not so affect it. Therefore will I howl for Moab. I will cry out for Moab. My heart shall mourn for the men of Kir Heres. His lies. His lies. Deceiving. And being deceived. You know one of the worst kind of deceptions out there that one could possibly encounter is the self-deception. Oh, and you see this, this is rife with the easy believism devils. Rife with them. Why? Because they save themselves by their mere belief. I just believed. And therefore I'm saved. What about repentance? And come on, come on, you easy believism devils. What, what is it? Repentance is going from unbelief to belief. Uh, the devils also believe. Oh, thou believest there is one God? Well, no, you don't actually, do you? Because you believe that the three persons make one God. Woohoo! Yeah. But thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Hmm. And, oh, repentance is a work. Hmm. Just like prayer is a work, right? Deceiving and being deceived. Self-deceived. God gives you over to that self-deception because you do not want to believe the truth. You have not received the love of the truth. Okay? And having a love of the truth, you know that there's none righteous, no, not one, including yourself. But since you just believe, right? See how that works? Self-deception. You see that? Okay? Ezekiel, the beloved Ezekiel 16, <laughs> you know, Ezekiel 16 is 63 verses, um, while an uh, expository video on 1 Corinthians 14 will be at least a two-day event, you know, two parts, each part probably close to three hours, you know. Oh, wow, a uh, expository on Ezekiel 16, that would take weeks. <laughs> 
But Ezekiel 16, verses 22 on to verse 26. Okay? <clears throat> and in all thine abominations and thy whoredoms, thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth. When thou wast naked and bare and was polluted in thy blood, and it came to pass after all thy wickedness, woe, woe unto thee, said the Lord God, that thou hast also built unto thee an eminent place, worshiping the work of your own hands, basically, that thou hast also built unto thee an eminent place, and hast made thee an high place in every street. Thou hast built thy high place at every head of the way, and hast made thy beauty to be abhorred, and hast opened thy feet to every one that passed by, and multiplied thy whoredoms. Verse 26. Thou hast also committed fornication with the Egyptians. Destruction and righteousness. Remember, as I have told you, as we have discussed on numerous occasions, for our instruction and righteousness, the Egyptians are likened unto a type of the world and those of the world, such as the Christians. They are worldly. They are the Egyptians. They are of the world. Okay? See how that works? But thou hast also committed fornication with the Egyptians, thy neighbors. Don't look at me. Look at that verse. Great of flesh. Flesh. Yes. Great of flesh. And has increased thy whoredoms to provoke me to anger. Yeah. And while we're here, 49 and 50. 49 and 50. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister, Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, mm. an abundance of idleness was in her hand. Was uh, excuse me, an abundance of idleness was in her and in her and in her daughters. See how I did? How I just rattled off in my hand, and it doesn't say that. Sometimes I skip a groove. Okay, that's why you gotta follow along, be a Berean. Okay. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor needy. They were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. Isaiah, go back. Isaiah 31. Isaiah 31. More about the Egyptians. Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help. Our instruction and in righteousness go to the world. You can also equate this to, do you go to the devil for comfort? To distract you from the reality of life? Hmm? Like I've said before, there ain't no stronger drug than reality, is there? Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help. Go to the world. The flesh, the devil, Satan. And stay on horses and trust in, and look at this, and trust in chariots because they are many. Don't look at me, look at the verse, man. Woman. Trust in chariots because they are many. The God of forces. Hmm. Hmm. And in horsemen. Because they are very strong. Hmm? But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. Hmm. Hmm. Yet he also is wise and will bring evil and will not call back his words, but will arise against the house of the evildoers and against the help of them that work iniquity. Now the Egyptians are men. And not, capital G, God. Hmm. Hey, you Ruckmanites. 
You do realize that, right? Posthumously, you've made Ruckman a god. No, I haven't. Yes, you have. Yes, you have. Okay? Uh, okay, some of you want to, uh, to attribute to Ruckman as being a great teacher. That You're entitled to your opinion, okay? Go, whatever. But to call him the greatest ever? <sighs> I don't think even His Holiness from Maine would go that far. I don't think I don't think even he would. Okay, when it comes to that. I don't think even he would say, uh, whoa, 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 calling, calling him the greatest ever? Uh, even he would probably be like, <laughs> okay? Uh, that, that, uh, that, yeah. God of forces. God of forces. Don't worry, we'll ride this train with me, okay? Let's continue. Now the Egyptians are men and not God. And their horse is flesh and not spirit. Note the lowercase s there, okay? When the Lord shall stretch out his hand, both he that helpeth shall fall, and he that is hoping shall fall down, and they all shall fail together. Jeremiah 17. Now, we have looked at varying things, but there has been a certain line that has been being addressed by our Father for our instruction in righteousness. Have you not seen it? Have you not seen it? We have thus far addressed in the scriptures instances where our Lord addresses those who trust in what? Well, Egyptians, their high places, their stuff that they do. Yes, the God of forces. Things that pertain to flesh, fleshly things. Ah. The equivalent uh, that we can liken this to is what? If Jesus had a church, it would be the biggest one. And who says that? You know who say who says that? Catholics, right? Jeremiah seventeen, verses five and eight. The God of forces. Thus saith the Lord: Cursed be the man that trusteth in man. There are people out there who put man on pedestals. Ruckman, the modern Ruckmanites, they have exalted posthumously Peter Sturgis Ruckman to godhood status. People have done that for his holiness in Maine. People have done that for many others. Um, Ken Hoven. People have done that for Ken Hoven. Okay? All right? Some have done that for uh, a lot of the charismatic guys, like uh, David Wilkerson. Son, you see in this? We need to talk. And I'm going to leave it at that. Okay? Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. The God of forces. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, 
in a salt land and not inhabited. And not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters and that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when he cometh. But her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Hold your place here. Proverbs 28, just one verse. Proverbs 28, one verse. <laughs> This is a warning. This right here, Proverbs 28, verse 26, is a warning. Uh, let's read verses um, 25 and 26. Excuse me. He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife. But he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. And the fool, hold your place here. Go to Psalm 14 or 53, but Psalm 14, okay? Psalm 14. I did tell you the right one, didn't I? Yeah, Psalm 14, verse 1. What is a fool? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Okay. Proverbs 28, verse 26. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. We know what a fool is now, don't we? But whoso walketh wisely shall be delivered. Brethren, people, if you run into one of these people, who says, God knows my heart. Run away from someone like that. Because when, number one, when someone says, God knows my heart, every single time, it's to justify sin and themselves, to justify the wicked behavior that they are exhibiting. Well, God knows my heart. He sure does. Jeremiah 17. Of course we were going to read this, brother. Of course we were. Jeremiah 17, now 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. That's why the fake hate Romans chapter 3 specifically. They love after verse 18. But they don't want to deal with verses 1 on to verse 18. Because in Romans chapter 3, well, Romans 1 and 2 and 3 address your wicked self-righteousness. When the Lord saved me, he brought me onto himself through the book of Romans. But see, you must be a good person, right? Because you save yourself by your own belief. And if God's going to have a church, it's going to be the biggest one, right? Look at all the Christians out there, right? Look at the millions of Christians out there. God of forces. Look at all the people that attend the church building, right? Look at all these people. Look at, look at the, all the number of people who watch the videos or who show up for your live streams or whatever, right? Look at that. God of forces. Right? What are you saying? Don't worry. We're going to get to that. Okay? We're going to get to that. This is personally why I wanted never to let how many people subscribe to the channel here be known. Because this has happened. It's like, you don't even have 500 subscribers. Who are you? Nobody. Nothing. But see, that mentality of the visual, the strength of numbers, okay? 
I have been made aware of some saved brethren of the Church of the Living God who have uh, not even 30 subscribers and they have said stuff through the scriptures. The Lord has said stuff through him. And it's like, oh, yeah, brother. Yeah. Okay. It's not about the number. Okay. It's not about the number, dear friend. But see, when it becomes about the number, that's, that's the God of forces. And the God of forces that is mentioned in Daniel 11, which we're going to be getting to here, uh, is not a reference unto the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Oh, don't worry, we're, we're going to prove that. Okay? All right? Paul addresses this, you know, where I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, you know, ye are carnal. But I wanted us to look in the Old Testament. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. This is why I have no anything whatsoever for these Ruckmanites. Why? Because... They honor the God of forces. They honor the number. They have made posthumously a man their God. Look at how mad you're getting right now because I said that about your hero. You need a hero! What's wrong with you? Hey, look, you... I'm an American, Jack. You want to believe? I'm, you want to? You, you want to choose that? You go right ahead, okay? Bless your heart. And I, I'm not meaning that in the southern way. Look for yourself. Look online here, okay? The modern Ruckmanites are a perfect example of it, okay? They are. They are. And I, you know, we're entitled to our own opinions, right? I have a lot of doubts about Mr. Ruckman. But I do agree where some have said that if Ruckman were alive today, he would be disgusted. Towards the latter end of his life, he did kind of play the rah-rah thing, okay? But never mind. See, that it's, we're not, I don't want to get focused on that. But it is a perfect example of what we're addressing. Perfect example. Look at the Catholics who exalt Sosa through Francis. They think he they they think Sosa, who Francis, is their God. They elevate a man to Godhood. Because that's what they're taught. And in doing so, you're worshiping what? The God of forces. What does that mean? What does that mean? You're making the things that you see with your eyes, things of flesh, you're making them your God. You're holding the things, the numbers of your attendance, the, the size of your congregation. Look at all the Christians out there, the millions of Christians out there, right? You're honoring the God of forces. You've made that your God. To be, you've made that your own big G God. That's what you've done. Why do you think idolatry is so dangerous? And isn't it interesting, too, that people to defend this will get so meticulous about, well, remember, an idol is just a statue. Oh, and God knows your heart, doesn't he? Deuteronomy chapter 32. This is 31 and verse 33. Now, we're going to be talking about the capitals, which Mr. Smiley Dave thinks isn't a big issue. Where, where did I say? 31 and verse 33. For their lowercase r rock is not as our, capital R, rock. 
Now, there are incidences in Scripture where it appears as the lowercase r rock, and it is clearly talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, not Dwayne. <laughs> Not Dwayne The Rock Johnson, who in his steroid-fueled uh, whatever could pull me into an oblivion. Yeah. For their rock is not as our, capital R, rock. Even their enemies, themselves being judges. What are their rock? What is their rock? The number of congregants... Hmm? That sea of people that you see? Hmm? The work of your own hands? The $100,000 piece of paper on the wall? Hmm? Even our enemies themselves being judges. Think about that. You are boasting that you are of the elect, right? Why are you elect? Well, God cho chose me from the beginning. So there must be something good in you, right? Even our enemies themselves being judges. Or you're elect because of the color of your skin. And you call, and you some of you have called me a kindredist. But you're saying that you're special and elect the, the people of God because of the color of your skin? Hmm. Or you just believe? Yeah. Hmm. What is your rock? It ain't our rock. In our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom. Didn't we already look about this, uh, what the scriptures in Ezekiel chapter 16 about the reference of Sodom? Of, now, granted, in Ezekiel 16, talking about uh, Samaria and Jerusalem, yes, yes. But the Lord brought up Sodom. Okay? Hmm, very interesting. For their vine is the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. And of course, the Jesuit priest, you know, the abracadabra, hocus pocus, and that stupid little cookie becomes flesh and the glass of grape juice becomes wine or blood, excuse me, right? Their rock ain't our rock, man. Brother, sister. And if you have exalted a man to godhood. Well, Brad, you, you've said yourself that Paul was the greatest of the church of the living God. Yes, I have. He was our example. The Lord chose him to be our example. Yes, he did. Okay? We, we have the written proof. Okay? But see, Paul is not God. Paul said of himself, he is a sinner. He was a sinner who is chief. Okay? Paul is not God. He was our example. Okay? And people have taken that and twisted it. And today have put men on pedestals and have exalted them onto godhood. Uh, and of course, again, I have to bring this up because it's one of the most perfect examples. The modern Ruckmanites who have posthumously made Ruckman a god. Don't believe me? Bible Baptist bookstore? Hmm? Some of the people in the comment sections about that Oh, wow. Hmm. Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. Now, brethren, people, we have to remember something about 
when we read about the events that are going to be coming during the time of Jacob's trouble. Number one, you and I, brother, sister of the Church of the Living God, we ain't going to be here. Okay? The Church of the Living God, the body of Christ, gets redeemed before the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? Catholics, Christians, and all her daughters. Okay? The three, uh, what is it? 33,000 uh, 33, denominations? Yeah, they're all daughters of the whore. Yeah, they are. Like mother, like daughter. Yeah. Christians will definitely be going through the Great Tribulation. Yes. But the Church of the Living God gets redeemed before the time of Jacob's trouble, dear friend. So a lot of what you read about in the book of Daniel, in the book of Revelation, in the latter parts of Ezekiel, okay, and in also of the so-called minor prophets, Okay, there's still a lot of stuff that has yet to happen. And a majority of that stuff that is coming, you and I are not going to be privy to. You have to remember that. So when we dive into things that are to come, it is for the concern of those who will not receive a love of the truth and choose to be left behind. Do you realize that? That these people are actually choosing to be left behind? Well, I was deceived. I, God made it a way out. God will show you truth. But see, he ain't going to point a gun at your head and force you to believe that truth. Okay? Neither is the devil. But remember that about when we look into future events of prophecy to come, a majority of them we are not going to be privy for. So when we speak of these things to come, it is for warning of those who are going to be left behind. Okay? Like the stuff on the drain, like you said, one brother said. Yeah. Yeah, we have to give them warning. Yes. Absolutely. Okay? So when you read in Daniel, the book of Revelation, okay? Instruction in righteousness is there for us, yes, today. Yes, doctrinally, doesn't apply for us. The book of Revelation does not apply for us, doctrinally. Okay? Yes, in the seven churches that are mentioned, not buildings, people, in the couple cha first chapters of Revelation. Yes, you can liken those onto certain types of people, a person, which is a spirit, soul, and body. Yes, you can, for instruction and righteousness. You see the redemption of the purchased possession, and then that man of sin being revealed, the son of perdition. Okay, you see it in the book of Revelation. Doctrinally, the book of Revelation is not written for us today. Okay, so is a lot of Daniel. Okay? You have to remember that. But see, when you go forth to make these things known, it's you always got to have in mind that it's for hopefully someone will wake up and come to the Lord on his terms so that they can be with us redeemed, okay, before the time of Jacob's trouble. And also to warn these people who receive not the love of the truth. But trust in the God of forces. Trust in themselves. That they are of us. And they're not. But Daniel chapter 11. We're going to read verses 36 on to verse 38. And the king shall do according to his will. And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. Little G God there. Little G. Okay? This is talked about in 2 Thessalonians. Okay? Let's read this again. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every God, little case G, and shall speak marvelous things against the capital G, God of lowercase g, gods. 
and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. Now, like I said, uh, right, right there in the margin there, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. Okay, hold your place here. Let's go there. Okay? Okay, Paul is talking about this, about that man of sin, the son of perdition. Okay? All right. The Antichrist does not appear in Scripture. Yes, Antichrist appears in Scripture. The Antichrist doesn't. Okay? But, verse 4 in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Okay? Let's read 3 and 4. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Falling away is those who say that they are of us, but are being made manifest that they are not of us. Okay? Hence the falling away. Many people are saying, are claiming, we're Christian, we're, we're King James Bible Christians, we're Christians. And as time goes on, they fall away. They ain't of us. They ain't of the church of the living God. See, they're a Christian. Okay? There are millions of Christians out there. There are thousands of the church of the living God. Okay? So the falling away is happening. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called, capital G, God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, capital G, sitteth in the temple of God, capital G, showing himself that he is, capital G, God. Okay? So what is, and right here alone too, this verse, okay? Capital G, God. When you see capital G, God, in scripture, okay, it is to be reckoned unto the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy, you know, the Holy Ghost, the Lord is that spirit, okay? One God who is comprised of spirit, soul, and body, okay? All right? But right here, that man of sin, the son of perdition, is going to come saying that he is the father, that he is. He's, uh, uh, while we're up there looking down, like I said to a brother, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, that man of sin, the son of perdition, who's going to, in his visage, I believe, look like the Roman Catholic Jesus, he's going to be, uh, I wouldn't be surprised, he's like, I am. That's all he has to say. So many people say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Yes, he did. He never said, I am God. He did not say that. You're right. He didn't need to. All he had to say was, I am. Why do you think it's so vile when you see those jerks like Joel Osteen, that wicked, and then that cover of that book, The Power of I Am, Kenneth Doplin? It's like, well, I am too. Yeah, you is a devil. Okay? People went to stone the Lord because he said, before Abraham was, I am. He didn't have to say the word God because in him saying I am, he said, I am. He is God. Jesus claimed to be the Father. Yes, he did. Okay? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Okay? But see, that man of sin, the son of perdition, he is going to be claiming to be the actual Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, and the Holy Ghost, the Lord that lives within you, the Lord is that Spirit, God our Father, Jesus Christ. Okay? All right? And hey, Sons of Ishmael do have it right. So do the atheists. One plus one plus one. One, two, three. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. But let's continue now in Daniel. Okay. So now there in, in verse 36, you see the lowercase g. Lowercase g. Hmm. There are Lord's many and God's many, but there is only one capital G God, right? Come on, even you devils. Yes, yes. For this, remember, in Genesis chapter 3, okay, go there, okay, Genesis chapter 3, and see, an atheist, I don't believe in God. Yes, you do. 
No, I don't. Yes, you do. Oh, this, and I've gotten a lot of uh, fire thrown at me, gnashing of teeth on me, for because when it comes to an atheist, I mean, I have a lot more respect for uh, some of the atheists I've encountered and some of these Christians, a whole lot more respect. I do. But uh, you want to get an atheist? You want to corner him and really get him to think or her to think? I don't believe in a God. Yes, you do. No, I don't. Yes, you do. Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. For capital G, God, doth know that in the day ye shall eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as lowercase g gods, knowing good and evil. See, Satan right there acknowledges that only God the Father truly knows what is good and what is truly evil. But he says you can be as gods, lowercase g, knowing good and evil. You can judge for yourself. It's all relative, right? And when you are the judge of what is good and what is evil, you're your own little G-God. I've unfortunately had some really good correspondence with Atheist End because I brought that up. Thus it is. Thus it is. Good correspondence. Things were being brought up. Questions were being answered. Light, even though it was email, light bulbs were coming on. Then it's like, well, you do believe in a God. Yes, you do. Yourself. Because you are the judge of good and evil. We who are saved, we are not the judge of good and evil. Because I think we already addressed that. How do we know what is truly good and what is truly evil? So the difference between the capital G God and the little G God, do you get it? Okay. So when you see capital G God referencing onto the God, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, and the Lord is that spirit. Okay? Right? We get that. Same with the capital S spirit. Okay? Same with the capital S spirit. Capital S spirit is who? The Lord. And the Lord is that spirit. Okay? All right? Don't let people say, oh, the, the capitalization ain't that big of a deal. And people will bring up like the 1611. Uh, when English was in its infancy. Tyndale's translation. Okay? Matthew's Bible. The Geneva Bible. The 1611. Okay, the inconsistencies in English, the up and down, no structure of um, capitalization. Okay, you see that. You, you read a 1611? Okay, you've noticed that. The inconsistencies in the spelling, in the capitalization, in the punctual, uh, punctuations and stuff like that. You've noticed that. Okay, even in reading the Geneva Bible, which the one that I got is written in Gothic font, you know, where it says Mofith, okay, S's are F's, okay, J's are I's, okay, all right, and even in the Roman font of the 1611, they, the S's aren't F's, but, you know, English was in its infant, you read uh, transcripts or what, the Tyndale of New Testament? Wow, that's, that's uh, challenging. You can still read it, absolutely. But that's, um, that's pretty, you know, triple E. And, and can, okay, you spell it this way here, and yet in the same verse you spell it a different way. This is capitalized. Well, that isn't. That's not. That is like, whoa. Whoa. <laughs> whoa. And you got to remember, the authorized version of the scriptures is perfect given by inspiration and without error. But see, the Lord purified it, okay? So the purification process. And of course, when the 1611 was first produced, there weren't printing presses as we know them. Each one of the letters that you saw uh, in the 1611, they had the number one, the little 
things, the little letters had to be put into a box kind of thing. Backwards! And then they would put the paper on there, take the ink thing, and go shit, shit, like that. Okay? And they had to spell everything with the little letters, piece by piece, backwards. Okay? But see, the punctualization, the capitalization is very significant. Okay? It's very significant. Okay? You can lead someone to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord, can, excuse me, excuse me. We don't do that. The Lord does it through us. Excuse me. Here. Ow. Excuse me. The Lord could lead someone to himself by reading the 1611 facsimile. Yes, he can. Yes, he can. Okay? Yes, he can. But you got to remember those things about the early translation process. Okay? The early translation process. Okay? You got to remember that. The printing process, I should say. You got to remember that. But capitalization is very important. It is. Now, with that said, let's continue in Isaiah, uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 37. Neither shall he regard the God, capital G, of his fathers. Of his fathers. So, this is God the Father being a reference to, of his fathers, the God of the Jews. Okay? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Jehovah saves. Okay? So, that man of sin, the son of perdition which this is talking about, is going to be a Hebrew. He's going to be a Hebrew. In order for Satan to deceive everybody, he has to become what he hates the most. That's a Hebrew. Okay? Satan hates the Hebraic people more than anything. Why do you think he goes at the length that he does to replace the Hebraic people? With the wicked Brizraelites. With the wicked uh, Hebrew Israelites. With the, with the, you know, the sons of Ishmael. Because, hey, they, they were the firstborn of Abraham. Yes, they were. But in Isaac, you see, it should be called. Okay? So, that man of sin, the son of perdition, is going to be a Hebrew. Okay? Hey, Jeff, it ain't Emmanuel Marcon. Jeffrey Greider. Watch out for him. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women. Okay, is he going to be a sodomite or a celibate? <laughs> He's not going to have, what does that say? Nor the desire of women. Is he going to, I've heard people, I've even uh, heard, I think it was Ruckman himself even said that he's going to be a queer. Mm. I think along, more along the lines as a uh, celibate, you know. Like today, men go their own way movement, okay. Men choosing to be celibate, uh, wanting to stay virgins and stuff like that. Hey, there's one guy uh, who I'm aware of who uh, wants to remain a virgin all his life. Good luck. Good luck. Seriously. No. May the Lord be with you. <laughs> really. Not good luck. Excuse me. Excuse me. But yeah, that, yeah, that's... I couldn't imagine, you know, because I couldn't do that. I didn't do that. Okay? But that's another thing to consider. Okay? Is he going to be a sodomite? Or is he just not going to have the desire for women because of a vow of celibacy, like a Catholic priest? Or a pope, or a papal knight, okay? Nor the desire of women, nor regard any god, lowercase g, and ye shall be as gods. Hmm. Now that lowercase g could, of course, uh, en encompass you know um, the Egyptian gods, okay, which have been cleverly hidden as the saints by Roman Catholicism. Okay? And all the host of the gods of Hinduism and all that kind of stuff. You know, Shimu, Ishtar, 
uh, and all that stuff, which are references onto the Queen of Heaven, the Roman Catholic Mary, okay? Which is Diana of the Ephesians, which Jeremiah talks about, okay? For he shall magnify himself above all. The third temple, during the time of Jacob's trouble, like I said, I told the brother, while we're up there, he's like, I bet you he's just going to say I am. And that makes sense to me because, uh, you know, when <laughs> the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, said before Abraham was, I am, the Jews there is like, oh, I'm going to stone him, kill him. And remember when the Lord was on the cross and they said, come down from the cross and we'll believe you, that you are who you say you are. What would have happened if he had done that? It's like, on the cross, you want me to come down? Okay, hi. They're like, ha, ah, devil. Wouldn't work anyway. It's like when you get a chance to witness with, uh, witness onto some of these Catholics. A lot of them, you're casting your pearls before swine. You really are. Our job. And that, and that incident is to be accountability. There's a track that I like to use that is purely an accountability track. When I'm talking to someone and getting nowhere, it's like, because I, I, I keep them in my pocket and I go through, it's like, can I give you a track? And they, if they say no, it's like, okay, fine. But if they take it, they take the track that is for accountability. Okay, because an accountability track doesn't really have the gospel. Why? Because it's just calling, holding them accountable. You've heard the true gospel. Okay, the Lord gave you, you know, set something up so you to hear the truth, but you didn't want to hear it. Okay. Verse 38, the one question. But in his estate shall he honor the capital G God of forces, and a lowercase g, God, whom his fathers knew not, shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Now, God, capital G, of forces. So wait a minute. That's about the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. But yet in the same verse you see a lowercase g, God, whom his fathers knew not, Shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things? Uh, you know, in the Proverbs, there's that verse where it says, And her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. This is written in the book of Daniel, written for the Jewish people, the Hebraic people. Okay? They knew of Baal. But the God of their fathers, who they, that little G that they knew not, who is that? Hmm? Because unto the Jewish Hebraic people were committed the oracles of God, right? Okay? So is this God of forces? Is this a reference unto the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father? Well, it's a capital G God, right? Hmm. Well, for that, let's remember a few things. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Okay? There are those out there who will like to say, that God and the devil are working together. That they're basically on the same side, working for the same end. And you can equate something like that with that horrendous, satanic gospel of Judas. If you're not aware of that, the gospel of Judas, uh, that claims that Judas was Jesus's very close, bestest, goodest friend. And those two had a, like a covert plan made together. Okay. That Judas was actually his bestest friend, even more loyal than Peter was. Okay. That's the gospel of Judas. Okay. And that, you know, Judas offered himself to take that role for his best friend. <laughs> People actually believe that. Okay, Satan, Lucifer, wants to be God. Okay, 
He wants to be God. They are not working on the same side. Okay? Satan is not, you know, buddy-buddy with the Lord. Even though Satan, and you look in that in Job chapters 1 and 2, how Satan has to go before the Lord. Yes, yes, okay. But, you know, it's, it's not that they're working together in tandem. Okay? Luke chapter 4. Verses 1 and verse 7. And Jesus, being filled with the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit, capital S, into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of Man, command this stone that it be made bread. And bread, food, is a necessity for what? The flesh. See, in the kingdom of heaven, uh, in heaven, excuse me, uh, when we have our spiritual bodies, uh, we're not going to be eating because, you know, our bodies get hungry. We're going to have a new body. Uh, it will be a pleasure to eat. Okay? Let's continue. Okay? So the temptation, number one, was what for what? That Jesus, who was fasting, uh, that he eat bread. Okay? Satan's temptation was aimed at what? Flesh. Okay? God in flesh can't be tempted, but flesh can be tempted. This is something that people who are of the devil, who worship flesh, cannot understand. Okay? And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, shewed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he does that through media today. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, that is delivered unto me. And to whomsoever I will, I give it. Delivered unto me. Hmm. What does that mean? Satan has been allowed to be worshipped as the little g-god of this world so that God's judgment can be brought upon those who receive not the love of the truth. Okay? Let me let, let, me let you in on something. There's no gray area. Okay? There are no shades of gray. Okay? You're either or. You're either saved or you're lost. There's no middle ground. Okay? And if you are lost, your father is the devil. If you are lost, you are under the condemnation of the law. Okay? If you are lost, there's no middle ground. There is no option C. Okay? Very simple. So those who do not receive a love of the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness, who worship themselves, who boot the door out of the way and climb up some other way, who, who worship the God of forces, Okay? Those who are, are those are the ones who are under the dominion of Satan. And Satan has been, you know, delivered this world for judgment's sake. Okay? Verse 7. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And again. How do they worship the devil? We just saw. He shows you all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time through the internet and other things. You go to one of these rocking and rolling church buildings where you got the Gene Kim swinging his jacket in the air. Woo -hoo -hoo! Okay, and you got these guys running around crazy throwing hymnals and stuff like that. Look at all the people. Look at all these people. God must be here. This must be God because look at how big it is. If Jesus had a church, it would be the biggest one. So it must be God, right? Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Okay. Like I told you yesterday, brother, 
there would be a lot added to this. <laughs> uh, the brother who I was talking to yesterday about this, it's like, oh, wow, Brad, we weren't even uh, uh, talking for half an hour. I told you, the Lord would add more to this, probably. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 on to verse 4. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, the ministry of reconciliation, okay, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Verses 1 and 2 are addressing that we are to walk our talk, that we are to conform our lives to the word of God, the scriptures written for us today, and this dispensation, the doctrine for us today, which is found in the Pauline epistles to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Greek is a Gentile, by the way. Okay? All right? And this is addressing, many people talk such a good talk, yeah? But can you walk your talk? Many people here on YouTube, you know, they, they talk like, a, they speak like a dragon in such a small, soft voice and never raising their voice above, above whisper. But what are they like when it's the four walls, the ceiling and the floor? Now verses three and four here. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the little g, God of this world, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Okay? So the little g, God of this world, is Satan. Okay? But see right there, and go back to Daniel, and verse 38, it says God of forces. So is that a reference unto the Lord Jesus Christ? Hmm. God of forces. Go to Joshua. Joshua 5. Joshua chapter 5. Okay? Joshua chapter 5. Is Daniel chapter 11 verse 38 God of forces? But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces? So that man of sin who's going to exalt himself above all that is called God and is going to go into the third rebuilt temple and say, I am. He's going to be honoring the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you see, didn't, but, 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 okay. Joshua chapter five, verses 13 on to verse 15. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? This is Michael the archangel. Um, remember John in the book of Revelation went to worship the, the one angel, and the angel said, See thou doest not? Now, we're not supposed to worship angels. Okay? Yeah. And he said, Nay, but as the captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. Captain of the host of the Lord. Now, granted, now you don't see God of forces there, but captain of the host of the Lord. Captain of the host of the Lord. The army of the Lord, basically. Basically. Okay? Even though that the captain of the host. Okay? Well, that's Michael the Archangel, is it? We're not supposed to worship angels. Let's keep reading. Okay? And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. And of course, uh, look in your margin, uh, Exodus chapter 3, verse 5. That only happens twice. In Exodus, when the Lord appeared in the burning bush that didn't burn up to Moses, and Moses turned aside to see, he said, take your shoes off your foot, for the place where you're standing is holy. And this precarnate form of the Lord Jesus Christ 
said unto Joshua, Take off your shoes from your feet. This is the Lord. Before Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Okay? This is pre-carnate um, appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ. He appeared out of nowhere. Okay? He just was there. Like he did in the Old Testament. Okay? Okay? So, the Lord is the what? Captain of the host. Okay? Now go to Revelation chapter 19. Okay? Revelation chapter 19. All right? Are we to believe that that man of sin, the son of perdition, in verse 38, but in his estate shall he honor the God of forces that he's going to be honoring the Lord Jesus Christ? When he says, um, when before he exalts himself above all and takes upon himself that he is, I am, but yet he's going to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, they're in Kahoot. No, 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 no. No. Uh, Revelation 19, verses 11 on verse 16. The second coming at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. See, we go up with him. We're going to come back down with him here. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. More on that reference here in a bit. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And when you read Revelation chapter 6, that man of sin, the son of perdition, goes forth conquering and to conquer. He has a bow with no arrows, and he's given a crown. Okay? All right? The Lord has many crowns because he's king of kings, lord of lords. Okay? His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the capital W Word of God. And more about the capital W Word of God, check out the, um, uh, what is that thing called? Um, the community thing. Uh, there's a list where all these seven appearances of capital W Word appear. You see a capital W Word of God, it's always a reference onto the Lord Jesus Christ. I understand people wanting to capitalize the W when they're talking about the scriptures. No. Capital W word specifically in scripture is noted onto our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? I would not make that big of a deal of that if the Lord himself didn't make such a big deal out of the seven times that capital W word of God appears. And it's all a reference onto himself. So when you see someone, I understand why they're doing it. I get it. You see someone talking about the word of God and they capitalize it, but yet they're talking about the scriptures. I understand it. I get where they're coming from. But the scriptures are specific about the capital W word of God. It only appears seven times and it's always about himself, not the written scriptures. Keep that in mind. Okay. All right. So, and the armies, that includes you and I, which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Hmm. The armies. And in Joshua, captain of the host. Okay? All right? And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it, and that with it he should smite the nations. You look on Google Images, you'll see this picture of, uh, of the Roman Catholic Jesus with a sword coming out of his mouth. And, and no, 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 no. This, the, the word of God here, this is the sword of the spirit, okay? Sword of the mouth. And, uh, and in Hebrews chapter 4, 12, the word of God is quick, alive, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing, uh, instead of butchering that, uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, okay? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Go there, okay? Instead of butchering that, all right? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, all right? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Uh, 
For the word of God, lowercase w, is quick, alive, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the, to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. That's a person. We all have a spirit, we all have a soul, and we have a body. Okay? Here, soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, joints and marrow, that's a reference onto the body, that's what a person is, and is a chief and is a discerner, excuse me, of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Yeah. Again, God knows your heart. Yeah, he sure does. Back to Revelation 19. So in verse 15, the sword of his mouth. It's not this literal walking around or with a big, no. He's going to be speaking. A sword of his mouth. The word. He's going to be speaking. <laughs> Go away. Go away. Okay? And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Okay? And you got to remember, Satan wants to be like the Most High. Okay? Anti is to be against and to replace Satan within that man of sin, the son of perdition, the third rebuilt temple, going to go, I am, that's what I believe, looking like the Roman Catholic Jesus, okay, in his visage, okay, all right, Satan wants to be God, he wants to be worshipped as God, okay, so when he says here in Daniel chapter 11, verse 38, the God of forces, he can't be. He, it cannot be a reference onto the Lord Jesus Christ. It can't be. There's no way. Okay? Because now, go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 28. Okay? Okay? We've been over Isaiah 14, verses 12 and 15 enough. You ought to know that by heart. Or at least know what that's talking about. If you don't, you know, go to, I pause the video, go to Isaiah 14, verses 12 on to 15, read it. Take your little pen here, okay, take your little pen and mark it, get a highlighter, whatever. You don't want to mark it in the scriptures, I understand that. Put it on a sticky note and put it on the wall or something, okay? But Ezekiel 28, verses 16 and 19, God of forces, by the merton, by the multitude of, of thy merchandise. They have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. And this is talking about Satan. The anointed cherub, you read verse 13, and all those precious, beautiful stones, all those bright stones glittering and he was captivated he was satan was taken with his own beauty he was taken with his own brightness you know and no marvel for satan himself is transformed into an angel of light having all those precious beautiful stones to look at why do you think sin looks so beautiful and appealing to the flesh hmm? okay And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Verse 17. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. And look in your margin, uh, if, if you got one, uh, is there a reference on to uh, first, uh, Second Corinthians chapter 11? Hmm? Is there? I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, 
and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. And they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be, thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. Revelation chapter 18. The glorious, beautiful destruction of Roman Catholicism. And you got to remember about Rome, about that man of sin, the son of perdition, okay? In Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 and 2, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will shew unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Many waters, verse 15 in Revelation 17, and he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, Roman Catholicism, Rome, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. The God of forces. Verse 2 in uh, Revelation 17. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Revelation chapter 18, verses 7 on to verse 10. How much she hath glorified herself, Rome, and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her, for she saith in her heart, I sit a queen. And am no widow. All the people. All the number. Look at it, the numbers of Catholics out there. All these Christians. Millions. Maybe even billions of Christians. So with all that number of people. That must be God, right? Do you, are you getting what God of forces really is talking about? Let's continue here. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. And the kings of the earth, who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament for her, when they shall see the smoke of her burning. What are we reading to? Verse 10. Standing afar off for fear for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. That great city Babylon is not a reference unto Jerusalem or actual Iraq Babylon. Watch out for people who say that uh, mystery Babylon in uh, Revelation 17 is actual Babylon in Iraq. They're covering up for Rome. Watch out. Henry Morris did that. Okay. He's like, it's not actual Rome. There's no, her colors are purple and scarlet. Okay. All the kings of the earth are meeting her. Okay. They're not going to the head rabbi. It's Rome. Okay. All right. So, okay. Hold up now. Hold up. So, and back in Daniel chapter 11, verse 38. But in his estate, Shall he honor the God of forces? That cannot be a reference unto the Lord Jesus Christ. It's impossible. So, what is this talking about? God of forces. That man of sin, the son of perdition, the mass of people that follow him, like the whore, the multitudes of people, languages, and tongues, he's going to equate unto the forces that that is God, that that is an example that proves that he is God by the forces, the God of forces. He's attributing flesh as God. God is a spirit. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Yes, God was manifest in the flesh. And, here, and here's where all you wicked, coadjutor, Catholic, Jesuit devils hate this because you work for the God of forces. 
Look at all the millions, maybe even billions of Christians out there, right? You honor the God of forces. You call flesh God. God was manifest in flesh. Flesh is not God. Oh, yeah, flesh isn't God, boy. But see, the God of forces. The God of forces. Forces, peoples, flesh. He's calling that God. He's attributing those forces as the actual I am, the actual God of the scriptures, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, and the Lord is that spirit. He's calling the forces God. That's why that's capitalized. You want another example of this? Philippians chapter 3. And the brother who, um, who basically uh, had a big part of bringing this about, it's like, I was wondering when you were going to get to that. Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 on verse 19. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. I love that word, ensample. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even, weep, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Because the cross of Christ is what? Death. Death to yourself. Death to your self-righteousness. And then when you got someone who's calling, well, I'm, I'm a, the elect. Uh, I don't even have to pray. I just have to thank God for electing me, right? Or uh, I just believe, and I'll, you know, prayers of work. Or I'm black. Or I'm from England. Or whatever. Okay? Yeah. They're enemies of the cross of Christ. Whose end is their destruction. Whose capital G God is their belly. Do you see that? Don't look at me. Look at the verse. Whose God is their belly. And in Daniel eleven thirty eight, 38, God of forces. Okay? Now, what's going on here? Is, are you going to tell me that in verse 19 in Philippians chapter 3, God of their belly? No. Out of your belly shall come living water. Yes. What is this saying? Let's finish the verse. And whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. God is their belly. The belly is what? Flesh. What, you're going to try to tell me verse 19 there is a reference on the Lord Jesus Christ? Some of you devils out there would probably try to say that. So, Daniel chapter 11, verse 38, God of forces, is not a reference on to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not telling us that the, that man of sin, the son of perdition, is working for the Lord Jesus Christ or honoring the Lord Jesus Christ. No, he's calling all that flesh God. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. Yes! This itself Oh, and you hate this. Because you're stupid, willfully ignorant. Aren't you, pal? Yeah, you hate this. This is not God. This is, flesh is not God. And see the devil and all his ministers of righteousness. They want you to believe that flesh is God. God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Yes. Yes. And because the Lord kept the law perfectly and never sinned, okay? Therefore, because he did what no man could do, that flesh was sanctified. Hence, the blood was pure because... Joseph wasn't his father. Oh, 
You see how that works? Okay? You see how that works? I know a lot of you devils out there who worship the skin suit are too stupid to understand that because you work for Babylon. Mystery Babylon. Catholicism. You have no concept what the circumcision made without hands is. Okay? Flesh is not God. But see, that man of sin, the God of forces, all those people, that's what that's talking about. He's equating basically flesh, man, as God. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. One verse. Verse 23. A Catholic. <laughs> but he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Because that's what Satan is all about. Because that's all he's got. This. The temptations of our, unto our Lord Jesus Christ. God can't be tempted with sin. But yet, Satan tempted. What? What was Satan's temptations aimed at? Couldn't tempt God. But all the temptations were fleshly temptations. Every single one of them. So the God of forces that that man of sin is uh, attributing the capital G God is, he's calling flesh God. See how that works? Oh, you hate that, don't you? Good. Because it exposes you for who you really are. Okay? And Genesis chapter 3, go back there. Okay? Uh, and Matthew chapter 16, For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. <laughs> Verses 14 and 15. Remember the curse? Wait, what are you doing? What are you doing? What is that? Genesis chapter 3. Remember the curse? Verses 14 and 15. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Satan, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, upon thy belly, whose God is their belly. Okay? Yeah, see the tie-in? Okay? And thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Thus shalt thou eat. So, he shall go on his belly, and we just saw in Philippians chapter 3 about whose God is their belly and mind earthly things. Okay? Verse 15. First mention about Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Okay? First prophecy of it. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Okay? But... Again, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and these guys who are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose God is their belly, who mind earthly things. Okay? So, Satan will be about his belly, go all, will be on his belly, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Um, verses 17 on to verse 19 now. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, Man's supposed to be the head, sisters. Yeah. And hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herbs, the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. <laughs> Upon thy belly, verse 14, thou shalt go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. 
So in Matthew chapter 16, verse 23, For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. And in Philippians chapter 3, which I closed, right? Uh, closed the scriptures in that. Philippians chapter 3, verse 19, Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. So Satan crawls around on his belly and is all about the belly and minds earthly things. And he's to devour dust, and you are made, you and I are made of dust. The God of forces. Do you get it? Hmm? Okay. Second Corinthians chapter 10. Second Corinthians chapter 10. Okay. Verses 1 on verse 7. Now I, Paul myself. Beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence and base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, wherewith I think it to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, carnal, fleshly, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, that's what the strongholds are, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringeth into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience, where when your obedience is fulfilled. Do ye look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ's, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ's, even so are we Christ's. In John chapter 7, okay, John chapter 7, verse 24, our Lord says, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Appearance. Now, People will twist that and say, you know, because like some young woman with green hair spikes showing off her cleavage, pardon me, dressed in saucer raspage pants, uh, sporting her tattoos, showing off her body, rubbing it in people's faces. You're the bad guy if you look, okay? But yet at her McDonald's food, she's going to pray. Don't judge according to the the appearance. Okay, if someone were really saved, are you going to walk around like that? Or rather, judge not according to their appearance. I've had people say to me that people because of the color of their skin means they can't be saved. From both of Japheth and of Ham. The one not saying that I was of Esau. Okay? Just because someone has a different skin color than you. Because someone isn't wearing a suit and tie. That's a trademark of the Rukmanite Baptist. You got to always wear the suit and tie, right? You got to have your special uniforms, right? Or, you know, and, and even James addresses this, okay? You say to the one in the gay clothing, happy clothing, come on up. But you who look like you're homeless, sit thou hither, okay? See, that's judging on the appearance. But our Lord says, but judge righteous judgment. Dear friend, how, what is righteous judgment? Don't judge me. What's your standard for judgment? Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. What's your standard for judgment? The standard for judgment, dear friend, is right here, the authorized version. Examine yourself. Prove your own selves, whether ye be in the faith. Okay? What is that? 2 Corinthians chapter 13 or 1 Corinthians chapter 13? Someone put that in the description box, please. What is that? I'll, I'll, I'll remember. I'll do that. 144, uh, 
20. Okay, I'll remember that, okay? But this is how we judge righteously. See, man cannot judge righteously in and of himself because we believe we are gods knowing good and evil. We can't judge righteously. So to judge righteous judgment, there is only one way to do that, through the scriptures. And we judge ourselves first through the scriptures. And hence, we are able to judge others. See how that works? Like I've told you many times before, people. Many times. Many times. When someone says, don't judge, every single time without exception, they're trying to justify sin. No, don't judge according to the outward appearance. It's like, I'm not. I'm judging righteous judgment according to the scriptures. And you are of the world. Okay, you don't rightly divide the word of truth. You're saying because of the because I'm of Japheth, I can't be saved. <laughs> oh no, what is it? Because I'm of Esau, I can't be saved. The Lord rebuke you, you wicked heretic. Okay, we judge righteous judgment by the scriptures, rightly divided, and in salvation there is no distinction. Jew or Gentile, Republican or Demokami, okay? Bond or free, <laughs> barbarian or Scythian, okay? In salvation, there is no distinction. Man or woman, there is no distinction in salvation. We are to judge righteous judgment. But see, that man of sin, the son of perdition, who will be honoring the capital G, God of forces, he is equating those forces as if they are God. Like we already saw the example in uh, Philippians chapter 3. You also got to remember too, in uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 21, okay? 1 Chronicles chapter 21, that, that's one of Satan's tactics from the beginning, okay? 1 Chronicles chapter uh, 21, Verses 1 on to verse 4. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Ah, some of you are like, wait a minute. There's a contradiction. Because of 2 Samuel 24. Oh, hold your place there. Because of 2 Samuel uh, 24. Okay, that's a contradiction. Uh, no. No. 2 no. Samuel chapter 24. Verse uh, 1. And again the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. So see, see, that's a contradiction, right? <laughs> no. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. God was angry with Israel for some reason at this time. So what did the Lord allow to happen? God was angry at Israel at this time. Satan is always angry at Israel. He hates Israel. He hates God's chosen people. Satan hates what God loves. Okay? But God, the Lord, our Father, Jesus Christ, the Lord is that spirit, he was angry at Israel for something at this time. And in 1 Chronicles 21, where it says, And Satan stood up against Israel to provoke David to number Israel, God allowed Satan to do it. And you read about that in Job chapter 1 and 2, where Satan was given permission to afflict Job. Okay? You're part of, you're of this world. The father, your father is the devil. Uh, he doesn't need God's permission to attack his own children. But if you are of God, Satan needs the Lord's permission to do something to you. Okay? Okay? All right? So Satan was given permission to provoke David because the Lord was angry with Israel. Hence, Satan being allowed to do stuff for judgment's sake. Okay? It's not a contradiction. Now let's continue in 1 Chronicles chapter 21 on to verse 4 again. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And David said to Joab, <laughs> Joab, <laughs> righteous Joab, yeah. 
And David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people, Go number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan, and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. And righteous Joab. And Joab answered, The Lord make his people an hundred times so many more as they be. But my lord the king, are they not all my lord's servants? Why then doth my lord require this thing? Why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? Joab, who, who murdered to keep his position, okay? Who blatantly disregarded the command of the king. You know, good old Joab. But yet Joab had enough sense here to be like, and this is an incident where someone who is not right with the Lord being allowed to say something to someone who is. Yes, that happens. Joab's like, my Lord, why be concentrated in the number? Verse 4, Nevertheless, the king's word prevail against Joab, Wherefore Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. He went to number the people so that David could find out how many people the number of forces there were. And remember about uh, Gideon, where, uh, yeah, it was Gideon, right? With the 300 people. It started out with more, and the Lord's like, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. That's way too many people, okay? Way too many people, then you all think that you did it. No, 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 no. Get rid of a bunch of these guys so that they can know that only I was the one who allowed you to do that, okay? But see, the God of forces thing, okay? Satan was allowed to provoke David, so David would have, for a moment, Look at all those people. And attribute that to God? As God? You see? Now let's read verses 5 and 8 here. Okay? And Joab gave the sum of the number of the people unto David. And all they of Israel were a thousand thousand and a hundred thousand men that drew the sword. And Judah was four hundred uh, threescore and ten thousand men that drew sword. But Levi and Benjamin counted he not among them, for the king's word was abominable to Joab. Okay? Righteous Joab. But see, David was what? Glorying in the forces. As that man of sin, the son of perdition, will do the god of forces. See, Satan provoked David. And this is a tactic of Satan. To honor the God of forces. That's why we are looking at this. Do you see? Do you understand? Okay. Verse 7. And God was displeased with this thing. Therefore he smote Israel. Look at David's reaction here. And David said unto God, I have sinned greatly. David repented. Because I have done this thing. But now I beseech thee. Do away with the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. Behaved as if he said in his heart, there is no God. We've already looked at what a fool is. A fool says in his heart, there is no God. So to behave foolishly is, to be foolish is to behave as if you say in, their heart, in your heart, there is no God. And David behaved as if he said in his heart, there is no God. But I want to know the extent of the number of my army. Of my army. Look at him. That's a tactic of Satan. That's a satanic tactic. God allowed that to happen so he could, uh, uh, you know, smite Israel, okay, for whatever it was, Lord just and perfect, okay? You see? So where it says in Daniel chapter 11, verse 38, about the God of forces, has nothing to do with the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. It has everything to do with that man of sin, the son of perdition, acknowledging those forces as if they are God, come from God. Hence, that this is God. With the tie-in with Philippians chapter 3. 
You see that? That's what that means. That's what that means. Okay? Now, let's go to these devil's least favorite part of Scripture. Okay? Romans chapter 8, and we will be done. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 on to verse 14. Okay? There is, there, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the capital S Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemn sin in the flesh. I know that's really difficult for you devils to understand that. I know. Because you worship flesh. God is flesh to you. You poor creature, you. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And that man of sin, the son of perdition, with the God of forces, that's exactly what they're going to be doing, walking after the flesh. That's what every heretic, devil, deceiver, infiltrator does. They walk after the flesh. Where are your credentials? You have to go to a college to get a $100,000 piece of paper for yourself. huh? Where's your suit and tie? Hmm? For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the capital S Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Capital S, the Lord. Uh, did we uh, skip one? No, we, we read verse 4, didn't we? Let's read it again. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally fleshly minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now you got to remember too, Romans chapter 8 comes before what? Romans chapter 7. And Romans chapter 7, Paul openly admits that uh, you can't walk after the Spirit 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Okay, Paul couldn't do that. Paul, who is given in Scripture for our example... Okay, that's why he is to be equated as the greatest of the church of the living God because he was used primarily as the example for us today in this dispensation. Okay, but even he was the least of all men, a sinner who is chief. Okay, who had no confidence in the flesh, even though he could boast about the, his, the confidence he had in the flesh, but he didn't. And that's where a lot of the people nowadays, even in the latter days of Ruckman, even he fell short. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the capital S Spirit, if so be the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And the Lord is that spirit. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. That's a reference unto the circumcision made without hands. When the Lord who is that circumcision made without hands is in you, your, your, your soul is not uh, polluted because of anything you touch. Whereas in the Old Testament, you know, uh, body and soul were connected. That's why you couldn't eat certain things because that would defile, uh, defile you. Okay? All right? All right? And yes, our Lord talks about, you know, what goes into you doesn't defile the man. Okay? Yes, he does talk about that. Okay, but you got to remember, like the uncleanness, you had things that you had to do for sin offerings for that. Okay? And that circumcision made without hands would come after the death, burial, and resurrection when the Holy Ghost and Lord is that spirit would be permanently given on to people who would believe on him. Okay? You understand? 
So they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken, make alive, your mortal bodies by his Spirit, capital S, that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh like all the devils are, to live after the flesh like all the devils do. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So. That, dear friend, is going to be it for this video. More admonition to mortify the flesh, to put down our flesh. Okay? We can't do it 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. No, we cannot. But it's a daily thing. It's a daily battle that we have to wage. Okay? So, that's going to be it for this video. Uh, hopefully this will help you. Has helped you. Remember uh, in Daniel chapter 11 verse 38, that is not a reference at all unto our Lord Jesus Christ. Not at all. That man of sin, the son of perdition, is essentially... The God of forces, all the armies, he's calling flesh God. And we've already looked at the, the evidence and proof of that. So, Anyway, uh, brother, thank you for uh, being um, the catalyst for this video. And, um, hmm. you know, brethren, a lot of people who at one time... You uh, listen to or whatnot. Don't, don't be surprised with what you're seeing nowadays. With the falling away. And how the love of money is the root of all evil. For which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. And pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Don't be, don't be taken aback when you see these godly men become charlatans, all about the money. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. It hurts, but don't be surprised. We know this is going to happen. Thank you for watching this if you do. Thank you to you, all of you, who help us, who pray for us. There's a dear friend of mine who may, who does have an opportunity to reconnect with his son. Keep him in your prayers. There's a brother uh, in North Dakota who's getting worse physically. Keep him in your prayers. And for those of you, and, uh, and also two brethren, um, who know how to get a, a hold of me via the hell phone. There's something wrong with the voicemail on my phone, so I can't get my voicemails. So be aware of that. Okay? So anyway, going to get this uploaded. Thank you so much for watching this if you do. We love you. We'll see you in the next video.